Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for finding time right before a meaningful holiday for this meaningful and informative conversation. Thank you for joining us for the program titled The Labyrinth of Israeli Politics, the Judicial Reform and its Implications. My name is Igor Alterman. I'm the president and CEO at the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas. And as you know, part of our mission at the Jewish Federation is to help build strong and meaningful relationship with the land, spirit, and people of Israel, strengthen Jewish identity, and provide exposure and connection to the global Jewish community as stakeholders in the growth and development of the state of Israel since its founding as a community of Jewish Americans who are deeply concerned and care about Israel, we've been watching the turmoil, the internal turmoil that has divided the country and led to one of the deepest political crises in its 75 years of existence. For the past seven months, several months, we have seen unprecedented nationally organized protests, which have grown dramatically just in the last couple of days and leading voices speaking out against the judicial reform, as well as demonstrations and remarks by many in Israel who support the reform. In recent days, Israeli government passed its first law as one as part of a greater judicial reform the current, uh, the current government coalition wishes to implement. So it is our goal today to help us better understand and be better informed and educated about this shifting dynamics in the Israeli society, how they affect Israel, as well as how the decisions and that legislation in Israel may affect us, a diaspora and the Jewish community abroad. We are proud to present today's program alongside our partners across Texas, including the Jewish Federation of Greater Houston, Jewish Federation of San Antonio, Shalom Austin. Thank you, of course, to our Dallas community partners. You can see all of our partners listed on the slide on your screen. Thank you, thank you for your support and partnership today. And of course, we are also grateful for our international partner, the Jewish Agency for Israel, for their leadership and guidance. We are ordered to have their leading professional joining us today to help us make sense of it all. So with that, um, I want to again, thank you for joining us. I hope you'll find this program to be informative, insightful and meaningful. And I'm going to pass it over to Sid Friedman, uh, Federation's Chair of Community Relations to introduce our speaker and the moderator for today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Igor. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sid Friedman, and I'm the chair of the Community Relations Committee of the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas. As the Public Affairs and External Relations Division of the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas, our Department of Community Relations is engaged in advocacy for Israel, legislative outreach, and interfaith and inter-ethnic relationship building. Our mission also includes social action work, and serving as a resource and convener for our local Dallas Jewish community. We are proud to help educate our community today about current political dynamics in Israel. Our guest speaker will provide an overview of the proposed and now enacted judicial reform in Israel, its potential implications within Israel and the diaspora Jewish community, and contextualize the recent unprecedented protests in Israel within the broader political climate. Following his remarks, we will move to Q&A, moderated by Michelle Golan Friedman, our Dallas Federation's Director of Community Relations and Public Affairs. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit questions throughout the program. With respect for time and the start of Tisha above this evening, we will keep, be keeping today's program to one hour. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Yaron Dekal currently serves as the Regional Director for Canada of the Jewish Agency for Israel. The Jewish Agency for Israel, or JAFI for short, is an international organization whose mission is to provide the global framework for Aliyah, ensure global Jewish safety, strengthen Jewish identity, and connect Jews to Israel and one another, and convey the voice of the Jewish people to the state of Israel 
to help shape its society. As director for Canada, Yaron works with 12 Jewish federations across Canada to strengthen the bonds between Israel and Canadian Jewry. Prior to his time with Jaffe, Yaron's career spans over three decades as one of the most respected and well-known journalists in Israel. As a political reporter and commentator for both the radio and television, he has closely followed ins and outs of Israeli politics and governments, developing close relationships with all the decision makers, makers in Israel, including top politicians and military leaders. He has covered at least 12 election campaigns in Israel. Between 2002 and 2007, Yaron served as the Washington DC Bureau for Israeli Public TV, covering US-Israel relations, American social and cultural issues, as well as internal US politics. From 2012 to 2017, Yaron served as the editor-in-chief and CEO of Galait Sahal, a national public radio station, where he oversaw an annual budget of 60 million shekels and 350 employees and soldiers. He is the winner of several awards, including the Sokolov Award, the most prestigious award for journalists in Israel. Yaron, thank you for your leadership and for being with us today. I will now turn it to you. Well, thank you very much, Sid, for uh, the kind in introduction, and thank you uh, for having me tonight in the great uh, state of Texas, which I had the pleasure to visit a couple of times in the past, mainly when I served as a Washington Bureau Chief of the Israeli Public TV and Radio, and it's a great honor being with you um, tonight. Last uh, Monday, two days ago, Israel has marked a milestone in its democratic life. 75 years after the Declaration of Independence, read by Mr. David Ben-Gurion, the founding father of the State of Israel, and uh, six months after the formation of Mr. Netanyahu's right-wing government, there are some serious cracks and doubts in the direction of the uh, liberal, successful, lawful society of the State of Israel. The reasonableness clause, as it called, has already an effect and affected on Israel already, on the political level, on the military level, economically, and obviously on the society, as we have seen and noticed the rallies and the protests all over Israel since January this year. Israel is polarized, is divided, and people might think that it is on the brink of a very serious debate might lead to a violence. Let's hope it's not on the eve of touring apart. Before I get into the judicial reform in depth, I'd like to say a few words about the structure of the Israeli politics, which is very, very different than the US. In Israel, we have um, re elections, which are party elections, and there are more than two parties. It's a coalition structure and the 120 members of parliament to get the majority, you need 61 votes at least. There are no limits on terms, unlike the US. As a prime minister can serve as long as he gets the approval and the confidence vote, in the parliament. The uh, vote is for one party out of all the parties which are on the ballot, and there is no direct vote for the prime minister. The prime minister gets his power from his coalition, from the parliament, and he is not elected directly by the people. Israel doesn't have a constitution, unlike the, U the US. It doesn't have a charter of human rights, unlike Canada. But there are laws and there are land laws which can be changed quite easily, depends on the coalition. All the talks and the debates about constitution didn't get to a final conclusion of having a constitution. And it seems unlikely that in our lifetime, a constitution will be accepted. In our current parliament, out of 120, the coalition of Mr. Netanyahu has 64 seats, 64 members. 
it was the fifth round of the elections. On the, the first four rounds, there was no majority for each of the camps. On the last fifth one, Netanyahu astonished, shocked the, par the, the parliament and the country with 64 seats. Some of them are from the extreme right. And this is the most rightist government Israel ever had. In the coalition, there are four parties. Uh, the Likud party led by Mr. Netanyahu is the strongest and the largest one. And other parties are orthodox, either Zionist orthodox or Haredi ultra-orthodox parties all support Mr. Netanyahu. On the other camp, six parties, some of them right wing, but here is the personal element. Mr. Netanyahu is facing a trial on corruption issues in the last three years. And some of the members of the right who are on the opposition refuse to join Mr. Netanyahu as long as he is on trial. And this is the reason that he cannot have anyone from the other camp. Camp. Before this government, most of his career, and Mr. Netanyahu serves as the prime minister for 16 non-consecutive years, he prefers to be the center of his government, having a center left or a lefty party on his left. But this time, this government is a right-wing government. Many people across the United States and Canada asked me since the elections in November 1st, 2022, how come Israel became so rightist? What's, what happened? Is this ideology or it's all personal? The answer probably is ideology and personal. And if we look back in the last three decades, the collapse of Oslo Accord, 1992, in mid nineties, when the uh, suicide bombers attacked Israel, it was the first turn to the shift to the, to the right from the Israeli public. And then the disengagement, 2005, led by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon from the right, bringing the Hamas to power. And the answer to the disengagement ever since is rockets and, and, and uh, um, missiles from Gaza Strip to cities in Israel. This was another shift to the right. And then 2021, we had the Guardian of the World's operation when in mixed cities in Israel, Arab and Jews, Arab fled into the streets trying to um, attack their neighbors. And this was another shift to the right. On the other hand, the fact that Mr. Netanyahu is on the trial, as I said before, all the parties in the opposition refused to join the government as long as this trial is going on. Three years has passed and nobody sees the end of this trial. What was the big protest about? Is it only about the judicial reform? It started with a judicial reform or I call it a judicial plan because the opposition doesn't call it a re judicial reform, but a judicial revolution, a revolution which will change the regime in and the structure of the regime in the uh, state of Israel. But it wasn't only that, it was also about having ultra-Orthodox uh, parties in the government when all the liberal camp being outside. But the main issue was the question, who is running the uh, judicial um, um, the judicial system. Is it the politicians who are elected or is it the justices, Supreme Court justices who are nominated but not just not elected? In Israel, unlike the US, the Prime Minister doesn't nominate the Supreme Court justices. There is a committee and the committee has politicians, ministers, members of parliament, members of the uh, of the um, uh, lawyers bar and uh, judges justices from the supreme court nine members and they nominate the supreme court all the judges all the justices in israel there is no hearing in the parliament and it's a decision of the committee and only of the committee the committee is 
has the sovereignty to nominate the judges. In the last 20, 25 years, Supreme Court power became, has changed and it became a very powerful, influential institution in the democratic life of Israel. The right-wing parties believe that the power got, the, the, the power they have grown too, too much and the, and the Supreme Court should go back 20, 25 years uh, backwards to the situation that it makes decision, but it doesn't replace the elected body, which is the Knesset, the parliament, and also the government. I'd like to share with you the presentation about the Supreme Court and about the uh, debate right now in Israel regarding this reform slash um, revolution. So the, this is the Knesset, this is the debate. And as I said before, there is also uh, a debate about the terminology. The government says we are advocating for a judicial reform. The opposition calling for a regime uh, or judicial revolution. It's not just a reform. This is a laundry of words, says the opposition. And we see here um, the leader of the opposition on the left, Mr. Lapid, who was the prime minister of Israel for a very short time, uh, for four months, and Mr. Netanyahu, who is the longest serving prime minister Israel ever had. Um, as I said before, 16 years in power, and there is no limit of terms. The key players of this uh, judicial plan are two. On the right, the Minister of Justice, Mr. Yariv Levin, he is a Likud member. He is a very popular Likud member. At the primaries for the list of the Likud members of parliament, he got the first place after Mr. Netanyahu. He is very powerful, very influential, and very popular in the Likud party. On the left, the chairman of the Constitution Knesset Committee, his name is Mr. Simcha Rotman. He is from the Zionist, Zionist uh, Orthodox Party, led by uh, Mr. Smotrich, who is one of the uh, extreme right head of parties in Israel's current government. Who are the targets of this whole debate? According to the plan, there are two women. On the right hand side, the Supreme Court. Chief Justice, Mrs. Esther Hayut, and on the left-hand side, the Attorney General of Israel, the first female serving as an Attorney General. Her name is Gali Baharav Miara, and the reason I mentioned that both women, they led two important institutions, which the government would like to try to diminish the both institutions power. Now, when we talk about trying to reducing the power of the attorney general, there are two options, two suggestions. The legal opinion of the attorney general will no longer bind the government, merely serve as a recommendation. So far, till now, a decision or recommendation of the attorney general in, in this uh, uh, structure is uh, not just a recommendation, it's a decision. And the government has to obey. The uh, suggestion is it will be a recommendation. The government can decide to accept or not accept. The other suggestion of this plan that the government and the ministers will have uh, discretion connection to the attorney general legal opinion and this is another change they want to have and all these are still on the table all the suggestions are on the table the main issue which passed is the reasonableness a clause which i'll touch in a moment other suggestions, the uh, government ministry legal advisors will be appointed based on trust not through a professional committee and thereby 
politicizing the process. Right now, the legal advisors of each ministry are subordinated to the attorney general. The suggestion is that will be nominated by the ministers themselves and the ministers will appoint people whom they trust, but their loyalty will be to the ministers, not necessarily to the law or the attorney general. Other suggestion, the role of the attorney general will be divided. A state court prosecutor will assume responsibility for law enforcement, while the attorney general will focus on advising the government. As I said before, advising with no uh, reason to think that the government always accept the advice. Right now in Israel, the attorney general is also the state prosecutor. So if there is a police investigation and in against any member of the parliament, any minister or a prime minister, and I should remind everybody that Prime Minister Netanyahu is not the first prime minister who was indicted and not the first prime minister who went through a legal police investigation. There were quite a few who went through this uh, process, including Prime Minister Rabin in, in the 70s, including Prime Minister Olmert, who served in jail for a couple of years. So Mr. Netanyahu is not the first one who is facing a criminal trial. But to uh, reduce the power of the Attorney General, the suggestion, it's still on the table, to divide the roles of the uh, Attorney General. Now, the, the other wing, and this comes to what happened this week in Israel Parliament in the Knesset, is diminishing the influence of the Israel Supreme Court. And uh, we see Mrs. Esther Hayut, She's the uh, Chief Justice of Israel's Supreme Court. In Israel, unlike the US, it's not a life serving term, but they are retiring at the age of 70. When they are 70, the Chief Justice, all justices in Israel have to retire, and Mrs. Hayut will retire in coming October, in a few months. So when we talk about that, it brings us to the reasonable, reasonableness clause, which means the Supreme Court will be barred from in, intervening in matters related or arising from the appointments of ministers or by appointments made by ministers. Right now, till Monday, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court had the uh, ability, the sovereignty, to override the uh, nomination of ministers as they did a couple of months ago. There was a minister from the Shas uh, Sephardic party, the head of the party, who was already convicted twice in uh, criminal cases, and they decided that he has to be, he has to resign, and if not, the prime minister has to fire him, which happened. And one of the uh, reasons for that was lack of reasonable. It not, was not reasonable, and this week, the parliament took away this option of getting override decision of the, of the government and nominations in the government or in any other ministries. Now they are free to nominate whoever the government wants, and the Supreme Court, his, the, end, the hands of the Supreme Court chief justices are right now cuffed after this. Additionally, there is another suggestion. The Supreme Court will be unable to override the basic land laws of the Knesset. As I said before, we have regular laws and we have land laws which are stronger, more prominent, more profound, more important. Right now, the decision has not been uh, legislated, but the suggestion is that they won't be able to override any land law of the Knesset. Other suggestion, any override of any law might be enact enacted by the Supreme Court has to uh, need the requirement of special majority of 12 out of 15 justices. In Israel, 15 justices, and they deal with cases, sometimes they are three or five or seven. It's very rare to see them sitting all uh, together, unlike the uh, justices in the United States. 
So the suggestion to override a law, it will be may make it the suggestion if accepted very, very hard, 12 out of 15 justices. And also the chief justice of the court will no longer be chosen based on seniority, which is the case right now. Instead, the government will effectively select the chief justice. So the government, again, we see the pattern, more power, more influence to the government on the expense of the Supreme Court. And this is the hard core of the debate. This is where it came from, where it started. The coalition, the heart, call of, the heart of the debate, the coalition will hold the majority of the selection committee responsible for selecting Supreme Court justices. Right now, as I said before, there are nine members to nominate uh, Supreme Court justice. You need seven out of nine. Seven out of nine. Other than that, you cannot be nominated to be a Supreme Court justice. No one has the power and the majority. The politicians are only four. The members of the uh, uh, lawyer bars are two. Ch justices from the Supreme Court are three. So you need a coalition to nominate a Supreme Court justice. The suggestion is that the politicians, government and coalition will have the majority. So in fact, they will control the Supreme Court nomination. This is still on the table, hasn't been accepted yet. The only legislation that passed so far is the reasonableness clause on Monday. So this is, in a nutshell, the uh, judicial plan. And I will add to it that we have seen protest. We have seen trial, trial of the uh, Minister of Defense to get to a poor compromise. A few months ago, the Minister of Defense, who is actually number two in Israel government, he called for a compromise, and then the prime minister threatened to fire him because he called for a proper compromise. On Monday, when they were sitting in the parliament, we saw the minister of defense trying to speak with the minister of justice to postpone the vote, to give some more time for the two camps to negotiate and maybe find a solution, a compromise, something that will save Israel from this, this 64 against no one uh, vote as it happened on Monday when the opposition members, all of them wake, walk away, decided to walk away and leave the parliament with no opposition. And the legislation was accepted with 64 members of the coalition and zero members of the opposition. Before I turn over for questions, I'd like to touch one more issue, which is related to uh, Jewish uh, communities around the world, including the uh, large community of North America and the United States as the biggest community uh, after Israel. And this is the proposal of the uh, ultra-Orthodox parties to cancel the grandchild clause in the law of return. The law of return was legislated at the early days of the state of Israel. A young state was born and the young state really tried to convince all the Jews around the world to come and be members of the new society building a nation. And the first one of the first law that accepted was the law of return. The law of return, it's, it's quite a complicated law, but in a nutshell says that any Jew around the world or children of, of a Jew or grandchildren of a Jew are able to come to the state of Israel and get a citizenship immediately with no process almost, but the fact, the fact that this is a Jewish state and this is the center of the Jews of the world, it's time to come to Israel and become members, citizens of this state. The ultra-Orthodox parties claim that in the last few years, the huge wave of immigration, mainly from Russian Federation, former Soviet Union, 
with a grandchild clause, when a grandchild of a Jew can come and be citizen of Israel, open the door, not just the window, but the door for dozens of thousands of people who are not Jewish right now, and they have no real connection to the state of Israel. And these are the grandchild of people who were Jews many, many years ago. So the suggestion is that the grand grandchild clause in the law of return will be canceled. And the law will be that any Jew who has a right to come in Israel to Israel and become a citizen, and also a grandchild of a Jew. Right now, in the last few months, as I said before, the government and the coalition were focused on the judicial reform slash revolution slash plan. This suggestion of the ultra-Orthodox parties will come to the table in the fall. And it already made quite a vocal opposition uh, in North America, as in other communities around the world, which oppose the suggestion to cancel the grandchild clause. The Jewish Agency, the uh, organization which I'm a part of, and I'm proudly be part of the Jewish Agency, has already stated a letter to the Prime Minister saying that on behalf of Jewish communities around the world, this should be done in a dialogue, not unilaterally by the government or the coalition. After a dialogue, talking with Jewish communities and with the Jewish Agency as the representative of the Jewish community, I'm not sure we will get to that point because of the turmoil Israel faces. And before, so this is a, a, an option after the Jewish holidays, when the parliament comes from the long vacation, this is something that the um, ultra-Orthodox um, parties would like to achieve. Unfortunately, the debate had a heavy cost on the society of Israel. There are two camps in Israel, and there is no real dialogue between the two camps. Hundred of um, reserve service, uh, military service people, uh, a couple of thousands, more than hundreds, already declared that they will not come to the basic training and they will not volunteer if this legislation is passed as it happened on Monday. Economics warned that the economy of Israel will face a serious damage. And we know that uh, Mr. Biden, the president of the United States, decided not to welcome the prime minister of Israel to the Oval Office since Mr. Netanyahu was re-elected in November. This approach is unprecedented uh, in the history of the relationship between the two countries, at least in the last three decades. I'm not sure it relates to the 60s or the 70s, but in the last three decades, any prime minister, after he received the majority of the members of the parliament, was invited to meet the president of the United States. Couple of them already visited as president, acting president, including President Trump, President Bush, President Obama, and President Clinton. Right now, the prime minister is not welcome to the United States and not welcome to meet the president in the White House. So that on the military level, we see already the implication. On the diplomatic level, also countries in Europe are not welcoming ministers from Israel as it was in the past. And on the society level, we see the distrust and the rallies and the protests uh, all over Israel and the tension between the two camps. We are on the eve of uh, Tisha B'Av, and we just can hope and pray that this bedtime will be over soon and there will be a way to compromise, to reconciliate, and to find a way to live peacefully together, despite of disagreements and debates as we have in any democratic, vibrant society. I'm going to stop right now and I'm welcome. I would like to welcome questions you might have. Please, Michelle. 
Thank you, Yaron, for that presentation. Since the situation has been shifting daily and even hourly in Israel, it's extremely helpful to have this background and overview. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I am the Director of Community Relations and Public Affairs for the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas. As your own said, we're now going to take time to share some questions that are coming in with our speaker. For those of you that are listening, a reminder that you can submit a question via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we have quite a few questions that have come through, so we're going to, to get started. Um, your own, as you've noted, uh, there have been uh, the quite intense internal social turmoil in Israel with demonstrations uh, both for and, and against these proposals. The recent protests have been called unprecedented with a day of resistance and a march on Jerusalem leading up to the first major bill earlier this week, while also seeing demonstrations in support of the reform. And we are seeing headlines saying that civil war is looming in Israel. This is all very powerful and, and tense. Can you help us understand a bit about what Israelis on the ground have been feeling? And were all these recent demonstrations in regards in particular to this reasonableness bill that was voted on earlier this week? Or are there greater concerns driving this activism and the reactions that we've seen? That's a very good question. Well, one thing is common for both camps, the feeling that something is wrong. I don't think there is anyone who is happy to see what's going on, the intensity in Israel and uh, the rallies and the protests. Most of the rallies were against the uh, plan of the government, I would say. There were two rallies for it, but since the formation, since the government of Netanyahu was formed, in January, almost every Saturday night, there are rallies and protests all over Israel. And I think you mentioned quite, uh, I think you, you were right mentioning that it's not just a judicial reform uh, plan, it's more than that. It's a feeling of many Israelis who are against this plan that this government is not legitimate. It won the elections. It won the elections on a different platform. And it was not the case, it was not the heart of the campaign, not a judicial reform, and not turning Israel and the fear of the protest that Israel is going to be turned into from being a liberal democratic country to a more, much more conservative religious country. And the civil rights of minorities might be infected by that. And I'm talking about the LGBTQ, women, um, people of color, new immigrants, that the majority represented by the government will take the rights from the minorities. And the fact that the uh, ultra-Orthodox who are important part of the Israeli politics, but they are, they are the minority. And the feeling that the prime minister obeys any request or sometimes whim of the ultra-Orthodox, people think and feel this is not right because the minority should be represented. The minority should be part of the game. The minority could be part of the coalition and could be part of the government. But running the country is not to the minority, is to the, major, the, the majority. And as I said in my, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, in the past, Mr. Netanyahu preferred total different coalition, which will have different pillars he stands on. The liberalism, not only the radical right-wing parties. But people from the opposition claim that the reason Mr. Netanyahu formed this government is his own personal case. Because if he wants to get any bill or immunity or any step through the parliament, these are the parties he needs for that. And the other side of the aisle will not be helpful. Either they are leftist 
centrist or rightists because they oppose Mr. Netanyahu uh, political stamina as a whole. So at the background, the protesters feel that there is a very personal motivation behind the scenes, which makes Netanyahu, Mr. Netanyahu, obey or respect or follow the, the requests and the threats of the ultra-Orthodox parties. Because in the past, it was a feeling that he is more powerful and he controls the government more than he controls it right now. So if you add the feeling that the minority controls it and it comes to more religious country and there is a judicial plan and Mr. Netanyahu doesn't control his partners, you get the reason why so many people, some of them, by the way, voted for this government. Some of the protesters voted for one of the parties which are part of Mr. Netanyahu's government. We see religious party, religious, religious members rallying, uh, marching, protesting, and it's quite clear that they didn't vote for the left, they vote for the right. But they also think, even if they believe that there is a need for a reform in the judicial system, this is not the way to do it. The way to do it is through dialogue, through trying to get a consensus, not unilaterally when the other side feels that it bans and it feels humiliated and being risked by this form. So there are different reasons for this protest, but we have seen the biggest protest in, in Israel democracy ever in the last uh, few months. Oh, thank you. Very, very interesting to, to recognize all of those different dynamics that are at play. And something that you also referenced earlier uh, that is uh, of concern, you know, for us as American Jews that have a relationship with Israel, and many of us have many of us have family and friends and colleagues and people that live in Israel, and we care deeply about Israel as a homeland for the Jewish uh, for the Jewish people. You had touched on the grandfather, the grandchild clause that might have an impact and. Um, can you share with us what are some other ways that potentially this judicial reform may affect or impact us as, as a diaspora Jews? And as a representative of the Jewish agency, what do you suggest we be thinking about in terms of how this might impact us or the relations sure. between Israelis and American Jewish communities? Yes, that's a very, very, very important and good question. There are a several, a, a few layers to, to answer that. First of all, uh, it, it might have an impact if Israel is no longer a liberal democracy and people in the United States are citizens of a great democratic country, which a long history of democratic uh, values, and also in Canada, I'm based in Canada, it might distance people in North America from a conservative religious state. And I'm talking about religious state is an orthodox state. We are not talking about a reform or a conservative state. We're talking about orthodox or ultra-orthodox state where, where liberal values are not important as they used to be. So this could be people might feel more distance. I know that I, I've heard the, uh, a very interesting podcast of uh, Tom Friedman from from the New York Times. And he said in the he said when I grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the religion of the young Jews in America was Israel. Now the religion of young Jews is civil rights and human rights. If Israel doesn't go through the beacon of light of human rights and civil rights, we might find the young generation of Jews in North America have less connection to the values of the new values of the state of Israel. This is one layer. The second one, and I haven't touched it before, beside the uh, suggestion to change the right, uh, the, the law of return, there are some suggestions to change the conversion process to be more religious, more orthodox. It has a huge impact because the when we talk about interfaith marriages and we talk about process to get people more engaged to Judaism with reform and conservative and welcoming, 
if it's not respected by the state of Israel, the center of the Jewish people, this is a huge, huge change. And it, uh, it might have a huge, I, I can't see it happening, to be honest. But to tell you that I'm sure, I cannot. Now, people ask me in the last few months about the campaign, about donor donations to federations, to the Jewish agency for different projects. In the last two years, we had a huge rescue of uh, Jews from Ukraine and from Russia. There are 75,000 new immigrants uh, from Russia and Ukraine in Israel due to the war. And North American Federation support, and I'm grateful for this wonderful support of, of this operation. Also, the continuous of rescue of Jews from Ethiopia continue, uh, uh, and people come every, every few weeks. And people ask me, should we continue to donate? We are not sure that this, if this is the direction the country decides to walk through, we are not sure to, that we want to donate as, as we did in the past. And my answer was, to be honest, donations are not for a party and are not for government. It's a, it's a, it's a support of the civil society. And the support of the civil society is important as ever. And if people feel the need that they would like to donate to NGOs, which express their views in this battle, either conservative or liberal, secular or religious, this is the time to show support. It's not to time the time to distance and disengage. That's my feeling as a representative of the Jewish agency. It's not when your brother is in a, in a problem, you try to help not to distance yourself from your brother. And we are in the same family. The Jews in the United States and Canada and the Jews in Israel, we are the same family. And we should try to help in each other at the time of need. And it's probably, I think it's, it's quite clear to everyone that this is a time of need. Mm -hmm. That's certainly an important reminder. And, and as uh, Igor had mentioned, at the start that Jewish federations and organized Jewish communities have been great stakeholders in the growth and development of the state of Israel since its founding, even before its founding. So recognizing again that, uh, you know, Israel is a, is a space for us to continue to support and to engage with and that they're recognizing there are many different uh, views and opinions on these, uh, on these actions that we will continue to maintain our, our close relationship. Um, turning to another question that has come in um, about uh, different uh, communities or different uh, relationships, one question that's come up a couple times is, how do you see this having these uh, this judicial reform and proposed changes, and especially there's been many reactions and responses within Israel and internationally to this, how do you see this having an effect at all with other countries that Israel has engaged with, uh, in particular thinking about the Abraham Accords, countries that are there, will this have an impact on some of those relationships? Of course. This program has an effect on many, many levels, internally, domestically, and internationally. I mentioned that many liberal countries uh, refrain of inviting the Prime Minister of Israel to visit. But when we talk about the Abraham Accord, for instance, and it's also a question, they monitor the situation, not only the United States, also countries like Britain, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, other countries in Europe. I'm not talking about Poland and Hungary, which unfortunately went through processes that Israelis would, love, would not like to get into. But the, the, the democratic Western world, is monitoring the situation, is expressed his con its concern from what's going on. Now, when we when you mention rightly so the Abraham Accord, and we we need to give the credit for the President uh, uh, Donald Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu that initiate the accord when four Arab countries decided to sign a peace treaty with the State of Israel a couple of years ago. And uh, it's fantastic that uh, we can fly over to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Bahrain and, and freely to Morocco. And there are flights all over, something that it's really, as Shimon Peres, the late president of Israel, used to say, a new Middle East, we see it in our eyes. 
people who remember the situation and the hostility of all these countries when a Lyle Israel is flying directly from Israel to Dubai, this is beyond imagination. But the Abraham Accord was partially done, but not fulfilled. The next in line was probably Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia gave already the permission for uh, Israeli airline allowed to fly over Saudi Arabia. It, formerly, it's an enemy state, but when the flights go to uh, India and Thailand, they fly over Saudi Arabia, which cuts the flight for two to four hours, save money, gas, and everything. The Saudis won't come to sign with an extreme right wing government if what they hear is the importance of the settlements and there is no gesture towards the Palestinian. The Palestinian Israeli track is in the freezer for a long time. But also we should remember that the United States was the umbrella for the Abraham Accord. And if there is a price to pay as the F-35 jet flat was sold to the uh, United Arab Emirates, the United States should be part of the deal. If President Biden and the US administration distancing itself from the current government of Israel, there will be no progress with Saudi Arabia because of the judicial plan. So domestic issue of changing the balance in Israel might prevent a peace agreement between Riyadh and Jerusalem because Biden has no interest to go forward and to help the government, and the Saudis have no interest to support a government with Ben Greer as the right-wing minister and Smotrich as a, a right-wing government. So we see a debate within Israel with a huge influence across the board uh, from East to West and the Arab world, and in the center, the president of the United States, who is not in favor, and he expressed his, his concern more than once and twice regarding the reform. Publicly, in his own voice, and through an interview to an Israeli uh, uh, journalist, and also through a, a Tom Friedman uh, New York Times column. So it, it, it makes a concern. Yes. and. Some another concern definitely of, of us who support Israel and care about Israel and thinking about the other relations and Israel's neighbors, uh, as you've noted before, what we've seen is uh, IDF reservists saying that they will not show up for their reserve duty. Um, can you touch uh, talk about that for a little bit? How serious of a threat is that? And is there there's a concern about Israel's neighbors seeing what's happening in Israel internally and domestic turmoil? And is that putting Israel at risk of potential uh, threats from its neighbors? And how will it be prepared to respond to that? Unfortunately, we have seen lots of uh, happiness among the enemies of Israel this week when Israel debate was, uh, there was a feeling that Israel is in flame in the society, the society is in flame. Now, lots of IDF reservists uh, said that they will not come and volunteer for training. And we should remember what they said. They will not come to the regular training. I'm confident that if, for God, God forbid, there is nothing happening, but if there is a war or an operation, to save lives of Israelis, they will come, they will attend. But I'm not sure that all the Israelis who didn't support this government will support, there will be a consensus if a war is declared by the state of Israel. Going to a war, and you know it in the United States, when you go to a war in Iraq or in Afghanistan, you need a consensus. If you go to a war with no consensus, a president might not be able to continue with a low approval rating because people in the United States lost their trust and faith in the administration. That was that happened 
since the 60s and Vietnam and all in the Korea War and then the war in Iraq. And I'm not telling anything that not, that something, something that people don't know. It's, it, it works in any democracy. And we have seen problems of the consensus, a lack of consensus since the Lebanon War. At the early stage of Israel, most of the wars uh, were under consensus. Six Days War, the Yom Kippur 1973 war, the War of Independence, when 6,000 people, 1% of the population died in the war out of 600,000, 6,000 died. It's a huge amount. Think of 1% 1, 1 of, the, of the United States, 3 million people. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's un, unthinkable. Since Lebanon War in 1982, there were some wars with no consensus. And the, uh, the concern is that if, now Mr. Netanyahu, to his credit, is not a happy trigger person. He's not a happy trigger leader. He doesn't want to rush into a war and a war is the last extent if there is no other way to achieve. I'm not talking about short term operations. I'm talking about a war. And there is a difference between two, a one, two weeks operation to a war, large scale war. Mr. Netanyahu in his 16 years in power never initiate a war. So I'm confident that if the worst case scenario happens and there is a war or an operation which deals with life and death, the reservists of the IDF will attend. But now for the training because of the uh, judicial plan and the fact that they feel that Israel goes on the wrong way towards departing from democratic values, they declared, and it's thousands of people, they are not attending as volunteers to this mission. And it, they are volunteering, so they have the right to refuse right now. Unfortunately, this is the situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, we will certainly be hoping and praying that there will be no situation where Absolutely. our IDF will be needed to, to respond to any threats. Absolutely. So, we are coming up on the hour uh, of this program and um, to close us uh, very briefly, if you can, um, to speak to uh, very quickly about what's what's next, what's coming next. We know that the Knesset next. is going on recess soon. How long is that recess? What do we expect to see yeah. happen during that recess and what can we expect to see in the future? That's That's a huge question, which I'm not sure that I can have the whole answer. It depends on Mr. Netanyahu he can continue with more parts of the uh, plan after the recess and he can stop saying we have done the first part now let's focus on the economy on global issues on global warming on trying to reach saudi arabia it's more important and the cost of living the cost of living in israel is very high and part of the pro the protest was that people felt that the the government is so busy with the judicial plan that they forgot the citizens and the cost of living young couple cannot afford buying a house or an apartment in israel they need their parents and this is this is something that the government didn't pay any attention for so mr netanyahu it's up to him during the recess to decide if he wants to continue with this plan or put it in a pose, telling his partners, let's do other things, good things for, for Israel. Now, let me finish by being more optimistic. Through the 75 years, Israel has gone via lots of challenges. Some of them are very risky to the well-being of the state. On the brink of six days war, there was a question in 1967, will Israel survive? And it did. In the Yom Kippur War, once it was invaded by Syria and Egypt, there was a question, will Israel be able to make it? And it did. Israel went through a, a economical crisis. There were times in the 50s that people had to buy food via coupons because they didn't have the money. So it was supplied by the government. Israel went through an assassination of a prime minister in 1995. And I had 
the opportunity to make the last interview with Prime Minister Rabin 10 minutes before the assassination on the stage at the rally. He gave an interview for, to me as a journalist for the radio, for the radio, and it was his last interview in, in his lifetime. 10 minutes later, he was shot. Israel went through the assassination of elected prime minister because of political reasons and survived. So I think Israel and the Israeli society is a strong society. It went through all these obstacles and won. Why would we be pessimistic and think that this time Israel will lose? Let me finish on the eve of Tisha B'Av, hoping that we will overcome. Yes, thank you. I think we we share that, uh, try to share that optimism and uh, thinking positively for, for the future. Thank you, Yaron, so much for your time with us today and for this really informative uh, and enlightening conversation, definitely helping us better understand what's happening in Israel on the ground and giving us a lot to think about. Thank you again to all of our partners who uh, were partnering with us on the program today, to the Federation staff and lay leadership for making this program a reality. And thank you especially to everyone who joined us today. We hope you will continue to stay connected with the Jewish Federation as we continue to monitor the developments in Israel and share resources and information to stay informed. Um, and one uh, quick plug for the Jewish, uh, the Dallas community members that we do have a community mission trip to Israel this coming November. So please visit our website for more information about that. Thank you again to everyone for joining us and wishing everyone a meaningful Tisha B'Av ahead. Thank you.